From the thick of battle to the edge of disaster, experience the impossible from the safety of your virtual driver's seat. Simulators date back to the 1930s, when they were invented as a cheap way to learn how to fly. Today they are everywhere, from cutting-edge military hardware to the latest attraction at the local arcade. At the United Airlines Flight Center in Denver, Colorado, 36 mammoth simulators provide a flying experience so realistic it's easy to forget you're still on the ground. It is very, very much like flying an airplane. I'd say on a scale of 100, about 99.9. It's amazing how good they are. When you experience a ride in the simulator, you feel like you're in an airplane and you really can't distinguish the difference. We can do things in the simulator that we'd never do in an airplane. We don't like how it occurred. We simply put the simulator back at the end of the runway and do it again. Today, most pilots do all their training on a simulator. And we can train crews now from their first day on the airplane through their final licensing and certification such that their first flight is a revenue flight. The history of this remarkable device dates back to the early days of flight itself. During the First World War, both the French and British came up with several curious devices to train pilots, including the wingless penguin that taxied but never took off, and a half-barrel with wings called the Antoinette. The Ruggles orientator was used by the French for testing pilots for the right stuff. In the US, not even these devices were available. Lessons in a real plane cost $50 an hour for what was often no more than a harrowing joyride. Ed Link, a young pilot from Binghamton, New York, decided there had to be a better way. Ed was a pilot, a barnstormer, back in the days when people wing walked. His father was an inventor and producer of theater organs. And these were the big organs that were used in silent movie theaters. And Ed found himself uh, with a lot of inventory of old bellows and electromechanical uh, devices uh, from his father's organ factory. And actually used a lot of that technology to put together his first trainer. In 1929, Link patented his first pilot trainer. It was a cockpit mounted on top of four bellows that expanded and contracted to provide motion. It could bank, tilt and even spin around. It was intended to be a training device, a cheap way to learn how to fly. But to Link's dismay, the only buyers were amusement parks where his pilot trainer became just another novelty ride. Determined. Link set up his own flight school. For a flat fee of $85, he'd teach you how to fly, guaranteed. Unfortunately, the Great Depression was in full swing, and even $85 was a lot of money. Then, in 1934, an antitrust decision forced commercial aeroplane makers out of the airmail business, and the job of flying the mail was handed over to the Army Air Corps. In their first few days of operation, five planes crashed. terrible time 
trying to deliver the mail and people were flying into mountains and getting lost in storms. In the 30s, most pilots flew by the seat of their pants, depending on their senses rather than their instruments. This required being able to at least see the horizon. Darkness or storm clouds created an unusual and very dangerous problem. The problem with that is um, something we call spatial disorientation. You have uh, inter-ear sensations that can get very confused when you lose a natural horizon and you can end up thinking you are climbing, diving, turning. In fact, that is not what you're doing at all. Suddenly, there was an urgent need to teach experienced pilots how to fly by instruments, and Ed Link seized the opportunity. He installed a compass and a turn and bank indicator into his pilot trainers, whose motion caused them to respond just as they would in flight. For extra measure, he added a hood so the pilot would be forced to fly blind. The army was interested, but they wanted to see the trainer in action. Ed set up a demonstration out down in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, and it was bad weather. They said he wasn't going to be able to arrive, and lo and behold, perfect salesman, he landed his airplane and demonstrated to the Army Air Corps and got the first order for, as I recall, was six trainers at that time. By the end of 1934, the first commercially successful flight simulator went into production at Link's small plant at Binghampton, New York. Its acceptance by pilots, however, was another matter. Pilots didn't really care for those. They, they considered them torture boxes. They weren't air conditioned, they had a small vent fan, but I guarantee you that at the end of a simulator training period in those days, you came out physically exhausted. With the bombing of Pearl Harbor and the entry of the U.S. into the Second World War, a massive and immediate demand for trained pilots was created. Nearly half a million civilians got their first taste of flying in Lynx simulators, which they affectionately called blue boxes. There were hundreds and hundreds produced of the so-called blue box. Thousands of pilots were trained in Lynx boxes. Other tasks called for more specialized skills. Because bomber crews flew many of their missions at night, they needed to learn how to navigate by the stars. They didn't have all the electronic ground positioning systems. They were still using uh, celestial navigation. So the company was put under contract to design and build a very, very sophisticated, very accurate simulation of the celestial sphere. With its rotating ceiling of stars, the Celestial Navigation Trainer allowed an entire bomber crew to navigate and fly a simulated mission. It was a real phenomenon in its time, optically correct, and uh, it was uh, quite an achievement. During the war, the Navy began developing its own simulators, establishing the Special Devices Section under Commander Louis de Flores. Louis de Flores was looking for means of training crews in a specific aircraft that would go beyond the instrument flight trainer which had a limited envelope of operation. And the Flores took visits to England in which he saw a trainer there developed by the British called the Siloff trainer. The Siloff inspired de Flores to develop a trainer for another specific plane, the PBM, that was used to hunt for U-boats. Because the Navy's fleet of PBMs were busy searching for subs, few could be spared for training. Working with Bell Labs, the Flores Group built a simulator radically different from Link's Blue Box. Instead of a few simple instruments, it included virtually every system aboard the aircraft, all interconnected by an analog computer. In those days, computer technology was just emerging. In fact, many of the computers were relegated to research laboratories. They hadn't found their way into commercial or industrial applications yet. But the technology was there. It had to be applied. Largely due to its increased size, the PBM trainer was stationary. It didn't tilt or spin like the old Link trainers, but it did have one major improvement. Now what's happened? It could break down. 
The instructor had a control board full of emergencies he could trigger with the flick of a switch. You could fail each one of the fuel pumps, you could fail each one of the transfer valves. If there were gauges that told about fuel quantity, you could fail the gauges so that they thought they had no fuel but they actually had fuel. So what this did is take all of the material they'd learned in classrooms about the airplane and about their crew functions and put them in an actual situation where they could do it. They could see it, they could hear it, they could feel it, and they would respond to the situation that was occurring. So it gave them the reality of being there. In fact, there are stories about people who were carried away. They, they were so involved in the emergencies that existed in the simulator, they said, let's abandon the airplane. <laughs> It was this ability to confront pilots with controlled malfunctions that was to give simulators a permanent place in aviation history. The end of the Second World War saw the arrival of a new era of larger, faster commercial airlines. To train pilots on new model passenger planes like the jet-propelled DC-8, the airline industry began using simulators designed for those specific planes. They were a great leap forward, no question about that, because they did model the exact cockpits of different aircraft. More of the actual aircraft instrumentation was present. With that instrumentation, you now knew what your engines were doing, what your different systems of the airplane were doing, and uh, you could really expand the area that you were able to train in, uh, more than just hand-flying the airplane. Their one major drawback was that they flew blind didn't have the visual systems that we have now. They had black windows, really. One of the first things that was tried was a point of light on a slit to represent a runway on a screen. When television came about, it was a logical, let's use television technology to do our visual systems. They attached a TV camera to a moving track that was suspended above a huge model landscape. Guided by the simulator's flight controls, the camera sent pictures to a monitor mounted outside the cockpit. You'd have a model of the real world, little trees, little houses. They were very massive devices. They had to have gantries. They had to move those gantries around precisely. It didn't work too well. First of all, it had a very narrow field of view. Pilots have a wide field of view. So when you restrict their field of view, you're not giving them the same characteristics they'd have when they were flying the airplanes. At McGuire Air Force Base, the newest thing in flight simulators goes operational. It's the first simulator to utilize a digital computer allowing automatic programming of flight situations. In the early 60s, simulators were being built that replaced analog computers with digital ones. The problem with analog computers was that they were all hardware. Even small changes entailed changing parts inside the computer itself. It was just like designing an airplane. Now, if you found out later on that what you had designed was incorrect, you had to change the design of the computer, which was not a trivial task. It took time and effort. With digital computers, Modeling how a specific plane behaved became a software problem, saving time, expense, and vastly improving precision and accuracy. Digital computers also had the power to simulate motion using a hydraulic base that was far more realistic than the old link trainers. Computers gave us the ability to induce the senses that you would feel in the airplane, the G-forces, acceleration, deceleration, all of those things now were able to be replicated. We weren't fearful of inducing the wrong sensation. The sensation would match what the airplane was doing. But far and away, the most advanced simulator of the 1960s was the one built by the Link Corporation for the Apollo Moon Mission. The Apollo Mission Simulator had to simulate every aspect of life on board an Apollo. It would have been difficult to design the simulator if all of the design data had already been complete and available to be handed over to the simulator designers. But when the design is evolving in time and you're trying to design a really, really complex simulator, the 
problems become monumental. All of those darn onboard computers had to be simulated, and worst of all, all of the external visual scene had to be simulated. Video images of enormous models of the Earth and the Moon were transmitted to monitors positioned outside the space capsule's windows. It was an exact replica of the spacecraft, including all the stowage. Uh, we would have all of the maps, all of the clothing, everything that you had in flight was simulated in its location. Every aspect of the mission, including landing and walking on the moon, was simulated. For the major simulations, everybody was on station because everyone was learning their role, how to communicate. One of the most difficult things when you have this many people right around the world all trying to work on one problem, you have to learn how to exchange information quickly and succinctly. When asked what it was like to go to the moon, Neil Armstrong is said to have replied, it was just like the simulator. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Okay. But one of the simulator's greatest moments came with the events that began on April the 13th, 1970. Just as Apollo 13 was about to enter lunar orbit, an onboard oxygen tank exploded. Okay, Houston, we've had a problem here. Oh, Houston, we've had a problem. We've had a main, main bus waterfall. We may have had an instrumentation problem, Frank. Roger. And we had a pretty large bang associated with the um, caution and warning there. Astronaut Ken Mattingly had been pulled from the Apollo 13 crew just days before launch because of concern over his exposure to measles. He was in mission control when the disaster occurred. Jim reported that there's stuff pouring out of the side of the spacecraft. We don't know what happened. We do know we're losing oxygen. We know that it's escaping. The pressures in the tanks are all dropping precipitously. The electrical power is starting to fall off the line. And what caused it wasn't as important as what do you do now? They were fresh out of ideas. They needed to get the crew out of the command module and into the lunar module. About that time, somebody remembered an earlier simulation. Throughout the entire crisis, the simulator became a test bed for ideas and solutions. We've tried to simulate virtually everything that we've had the crew to do that, uh, that is non-normal. Quickly, the astronauts moved into the relative safety of the lunar module. They moved people into there, and the idea was to get the electrical loads off the command module so that the batteries could be protected so they could use them for entry. The only vehicle that you can re-enter the atmosphere with is the command module itself. It's got batteries in it that are good for about two hours under normal conditions. Now they had to get back on course to Earth. They're hundred and some odd thousand miles from Earth going away from the Earth and not coming back to a entry condition. And so they had to devise a crude way of doing a maneuver to get it back on track, but now without the aid of the spacecraft's normal computer and its normal inertial reference. Using the sun as a reference, the astronauts were able to adjust their course enough to get them pointed back to Earth. At mission control, the ground team struggled with the next problem devising a procedure for repowering the command module so the astronauts could re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. It was a long, complex procedure which took people all over the country contributing to a, a, just a running series of debates and discussions about how to do it until they finally came up with a plan which seemed to fit the power budget. To ensure their plan would work, they tested it on a backup crew in the simulator. We just had someone read it to them. And when they found some statement was not clear or they thought it meant something other than what we did, why they redlined it, we made those corrections and then we read it up to the flight crew. Simulators are designed for the most part to simulate things when, when conditions are okay. And when malfunctions start to occur, you start to lose some confidence that you've captured all of the characteristics and all of the things that can happen as a result of malfunctions that made people very nervous. For the next three days, the Apollo 13 crew made its way back to Earth. 
The world held its breath as they began their re-entry into the atmosphere. It seemed like an eternity because it was the first time you looked up and said, is it going to work? When the picture in the control center that looked up in the sky and saw these parachutes, it was a, it was an emotional release like you just can't imagine. My personal opinion, had we not had these enormous integrated simulations that built this teamwork, it wouldn't have come out this way. But on the other hand, we couldn't have gotten to the moon without it. To the extent that there were skeptics in the world at the time, and there were, who wanted to go fly the airplane instead or whatever, I, I think probably a lot of them were made believers. It also inspired a new generation of engineers to come up with ways to bring simulators down to Earth. The war between Israel and Egypt in 1967 lasted only six days. But because of it, Egypt closed the Suez Canal to Israel and its allies for the next eight years, forcing ships to navigate thousands of extra miles around the Horn of Africa. At that time, those who carried energy around the world in ships realized they had to find another way to get from here to there. The answer was super tankers, immense vessels that dwarfed anything that had come before. They could use the same engineering plant and the same number of people and build a much larger ship and doubled and tripled and quadrupled the size. But with these monstrous ships came monster problems. In March 1967, the supertanker Torrey Canyon went to ground near the English Channel, spilling 30 million gallons of crude oil into the sea. Handling a supertanker was not like handling a smaller ship. They were dealing with an unknown. They'd never had ships that big before. The question was, how do you train people to drive them? One answer was found on a lake in southern France at the Port Revelle Marine Training Center where scale model ships navigated scale model seas. It gives you a sense of what the ship is going to do when you slow down, when you have to turn, you can put down an anchor, and all of the components of the model are scaled so that the holding force of the anchor, for example, is scaled 1 25th of what the actual anchor on the ship would be. It was a remarkable achievement. The channels in the lake, the miniature docks, the ships themselves, everything but the people, were designed to 1 25th scale. The downside of that, in my opinion, is that if you run it on 1 25th size model, you're running it at 1 25th of the time. You're doing it much faster than you would be doing it, and so you tend to want to do it that way, I think, when you get on the real model. Another approach taken by an American company, Marine Safety International, used massive model boards, similar to those used in flight trainers. But they were soon to abandon models in favor of an emerging technology called computer-generated graphics. For the first time, digital computers had the speed and capacity to generate crude real-time visuals. By the late 80s, these visual systems, now being used in flight simulators, ushered in the first generation of ship's bridge simulators. They featured 180-degree panoramic views, large enough to be seen by an entire crew. The simulators that we have here can recreate any environmental condition that you need, whether it's high seas, whether it's uh, strong winds, whether it's strong currents, a bridge simulator can model anything from a supertanker to a battleship and can sail into precisely detailed replicas of real-world harbors. Most of the harbors that we use are the actual areas where the person would be going and they must have the same visual cues that you would see. Continue left steer course 305. A novice crew can practice taking their aircraft carrier into Singapore Harbor before they even set sail from San Diego. Combat bridge, uh, coming right. 
Let us know when you get it. Ship simulators can even interact with other ship simulators. Pull to starboard. Push to stern. Pull to starboard. On deck, the bridge. As soon as you get an opportunity. They're all operating in the same water, same time, same conditions, talking to one another. When you're passing a point and you see your perspective on vessels passing, you almost feel the room moving. So the, the visual display really contributes to the realism of the exercise. Other problems call for different solutions. A single Trident submarine holds nearly 200 nuclear warheads. A Trident submarine is almost two football fields long, and it takes a long time to turn it. Junior officers get their training on the submarine ship handling task on the job. And that presents a lot of limitations, foremost of which is that submarines don't come in and out of port very often. When they do come into port, it's whatever environmental conditions or traffic pattern happens to be there at the time. In the early 90s, the Navy began developing a headset-based simulator they called V-Sub. We were trying to develop a virtual world that would make the trainee feel that he was really on a real submarine. The look of a cloud, the sound of the wind, the rumbles from the engine of the submarine, all of those uh, combine to enhance that immersive effect. With V-Sub, even the other members of the crew are simulated. I recommend continuing right to course 155. Helm Bridge, continue right, steady course 155. We use what's called a speaker independent voice recognition system. When the trainee wished to uh, ask a question of the navigator, a simulated navigator would come on and give him the answer to his position or the distance to a turn or any other normal question that he would ask of a live navigator. The trainee can do everything that he could do in a Trident submarine, but it could do it safely. Another area where safety mattered was driving. Since the 1950s, people have been trying to come up with a workable driving simulator. The earliest driving simulation that I can recall, and it was a chair like this with a steering wheel in front, some instruments, and two pedals, a brake and accelerator. If you tried to steer away from the, the situation, you wouldn't get any response because the steering wheel was not connected to the film. I lost interest within the first 15 minutes and it was essentially what do I got to do to get my driver's license I'll do it just tell me in response to the alarming rate of traffic deaths in the late 1970s government regulators and car manufacturers began looking for ways to make cars safer one of the problems they wanted to solve is how do they get the driver in the loop in their design rather than having engineers just design something have the driver contribute to it a simulator was the ideal platform for that. To test how drivers responded to new safety devices, a German company, Daimler-Benz, the makers of Mercedes, decided to build the first true driving simulator. The original concept was to create a working environment that would trick the driver into feeling he was in an automobile. To their surprise, they soon realized that in many ways, a car was much more difficult to simulate than an aeroplane. One of the things that came out of the Daimler-Benz driving simulator was an understanding of the complexity of the issues with driving simulation. How difficult it is to replicate real vehicle dynamics in real time. How demanding a driver is, a common off-the-street driver compared to an airline pilot. They needed to get the driver to accept the driving situation as real, so that when you turn the steering wheel, you get an immediate response as you would in a real car, not as if you would on the wheel of the Queen Mary. The Daimler-Benz simulator was successful as a research tool, but cost millions to build and maintain. The next challenge was to design a cheaper system for teaching people how to drive. There were a few early simulators that tried to become commercially viable, but they never really got the momentum going. They were either a little bit too expensive or a little underwhelming in their performance for what they wanted to provide. 
Only recently have driving simulators begun to hint at their true potential. Driving simulation technology we've now evolved is so realistic it can provide about 90% of the experience that you have in a real car. We can have you driving in a snowstorm. In a click of a mouse, we can have you driving in a rainstorm. We can take you down a freeway. We can interact with other vehicles. What we found is that officers come out of this experience shaking with a great deal of adrenaline pumped, and they look at the replay and they understand where they went wrong. Driving simulators are also being embraced by the trucking industry. They need to understand the interaction on how to deal with a gray-haired old lady that pulls in front of you and assumes that you can stop within 60 feet. When drivers come out of the simulator, they understand what it's like to drive a truck. They're not intimidated by climbing into this 18-wheeler and worrying about how they navigate on the road. The future of driving simulators is NADS, National Advanced Driving Simulation Project, being built at the University of Iowa. Like the original Daimler-Benz simulator, NADS is intended primarily for research. Its moving dome houses a whole vehicle. Inside the dome is a wraparound scenario. So anywhere you look, you can actually see the visual image of where you're traveling. With its near photorealistic visuals and the most sophisticated motion base ever built, driving in NADS will feel almost exactly like driving. But what about simulators that shoot back? Until recently, learning how to fire a rifle involved firing a rifle. In the 1970s, it occurred to Navy research engineer Al Marshall that there must be a better way. Well, I was really the, the first person that came up with the idea that you can put a laser uh, emitter on a weapon that will simulate where the bullet is going. Marshall took a combat rifle and attached a laser transmitter to it. It also had a receiver on it. The laser energy emitted from the rifle would reflect off of that retroreflective material and the weapon itself would detect that returning laser beam and the information would be encoded whether or not you had hit the target. Marshall realized that he could attach the receiver to other people, creating what became known as Miles Gear, the world's first laser tag. He also, in the late 70s and early 80s, began to look at, okay, how much of this technology that we're now using force-on-force force outdoors can we bring indoors? We could get a much better feedback on weapon tracking performance. How is the trainee holding his weapon? How is he aiming the weapon? How does he recover from recoil? While Marshall's team was working on ways to bring laser rifles indoors, commercial companies were also trying to build simulators for training marksmanship. For a training device to be accepted for uh, marksmanship training, for small arms training, the level of fidelity of the weapon itself is absolutely critical. It must look like the original weapon, it must perform like the original weapon, the trigger must have the same trigger pull as the real weapon. Today, inside of an average service rifle, there may be 20 or 25 feet of wire, 15 or 20 sensors. Another challenge was coming up with something to shoot at. Early systems had projected film scenarios, often starring the designers themselves. The targets just came at you. You would engage those targets and you would get scored hits. But the targets didn't drop. They just kept coming, so you just kept shooting. The arrival of digitized video allowed the use of video branching. With a laser disc, you can actually bounce around the laser disc and pick different frames in different segments of videotape to cause different reactions as a result of the performance of the trainee. For instance, if the gunner were to engage a target and put his weapon on that target, the target would surrender. Hands up now! Put your gun away, all right? Police, put your hands up now! With interactivity, weapon simulators could now teach not only how to shoot, but when to shoot. The next step was the weapons team engagement trainer. The weapons team engagement trainer allowed multiple trainees to work together as a team for the first time. 
It used a transmitter instead of hardwired cables, so trainees were free to move wherever they wanted. Even more remarkably, the bad guys knew where the trainee was and could shoot back. What we did is we instrumented the trainees with detectors and then we put emitters in the room. A grid of emitters sensed where the trainee was standing. So when he came into a room to engage targets, it wasn't uh, sufficient for him just to stand up and shoot. If he didn't want to be killed, he had to take the appropriate cover, dive behind boxes, look around corners, it's just like he would do in the real world. Another system called V-Wets incorporated a simulated patrol boat that moved. In other areas, simulators were being developed to save lives. In the mid-1980s, doctors at several U.S. research hospitals were exploring the possibility of simulated patients. Using modified CPR mannequins, they added simulated lungs, pulse, and even the ability to react to injected drugs. Today, patient simulators are being used in medical schools to train and test students on a growing list of procedures. When we did our practical exam, I felt like I was actually in an operating room providing an anesthetic. There was a problem. I knew that there was a problem and I had to take care of it. It was stressful. You can stress them or you can test them, but you can match them with their ability and the, and the patient's level of illness, which is something that we can never do in the OR. The military now uses patient simulators to keep medics proficient in the latest techniques for treating traumatic injuries. We've got to have realism in our training, and I think this program is going to also assure that we have prepared men and women uh, ready to go into combat. By the late 80s, the U.S. military was using simulators in almost every area of operation. But one challenge remained. How to bring them all together on a virtual battlefield. The armored training facility at Fort Knox, Kentucky, is where the U.S. Army trains soldiers how to operate tanks. In the 1980s, it housed a room full of simulators used by tank crews to hone their driving and firing skills. High-tech as it was, it still had limitations. The limitations of these class of simulators in the early 80s was that it was focused only on a single person or a single crew, but warfighting skills require more than just individual tasks. It requires the training and proficiencies of the crews, the crews and platoons, and the interaction of those platoons and companies and battalions. That required somehow connecting simulators together onto a common playing field, a challenge taken up by DARPA, the advanced research arm of the Department of Defense. Designers there soon realized that the problem wasn't merely a technical one. Many of the companies that were uh, building uh, the simulators of those days built standalone simulation and they were quite comfortable with selling the government uh, their product and the idea of coming up with network simulation was seen as a challenge to their marketing strategy. Despite this resistance, DARPA came up with SimNet, a way to connect rival simulators. Its first real test came in November 1992 at a simulator hardware convention in San Antonio, Texas. DARPA invited all the participants, competitors whose hardware was never designed to operate in unison, to connect up using SimNet. There was a great deal of nervous about taking a new technology, taking people that had, had no real experience but understood the theory and had read the books, but to ask them to come to a location to plug into somebody else's network, to interact with other companies that they had never interacted with was a great deal of risk. Ensuring that, that the wires were laid, that nobody cut the wires, that they all ran to the right place is just a Herculean task to kind of get everybody connected in a very, very short period of time. Sunday night before the demonstration, I think five out of the eight legs were either run over by heavy equipment or cut by a carpet cutter. It was now dark. The stores are closed and time to fix it. We got the best and brightest here. Yeah. I can't believe the answer is no. I think we got the last piece of the network screwed together at five minutes of one o'clock in the morning. I sure wish we had had a rehearsal. 
Damn, it worked. It was a miracle, really. We've let the genie out of the bottle. The future will never be the same. It ran and ran extremely well. Uh, it ran beyond uh, all of our wildest expectations that it was going to be as uh, successful as it was. Uh, you would see a tank and a Bradley next to each other. Then you could walk down the uh, conference hall and stop in at the booth where someone was generating the tank, see exactly what it looked like from their viewpoint. The tank platoons that fought in the Gulf War were trained to coordinate their attacks on network simulators. At the end of the war, one of its battles was precisely recreated on a simulator database, becoming the first example of virtual history. It became a history lesson of what occurred. But more importantly, people wanted to be able to think about what if I went back and changed some of the parameters, what would the battle outcome have been? This networking technology has evolved into CCTT, Close Combat Tactical Trainer. 500 individual simulators representing many types of armored vehicles can be linked together on a common virtual battlefield. When you get inside of a CCD simulator, it looks just like the inside of a tank or just like the inside of a Bradley. You could take an armor company from Fort Knox, tie it together with an infantry company at Fort Benning, put them on the ground in this very large 3D representation of a piece of terrain that was actually in Germany. Fire, fire, heat and dust. But soldiers aren't the only ones visiting virtual worlds. This isn't a roller coaster, it's a simulator. In the mid-80s, simulators began to be used for an entirely new purpose, entertainment. The world's first virtual ride, Tour of the Universe, opened in Toronto in 1984, built out of a modified 747 aircraft simulator. Within a few years, smaller versions began popping up everywhere, giving audiences a chance to experience the thrill of both the chillingly real and the fantastic. Universal Studios' Back to the Future ride took things one step further, projecting visuals onto an enormous dome that put people literally inside the experience. Simulators also began to make their way onto home computers. In 1983, Microsoft introduced its first flight simulator, a simplified version of what the pros used. Fifteen years later, Microsoft Flight Simulator has become so sophisticated that the military use a customized version for pilots at the beginning of their training. Another computer game, Sim City, took a different approach to simulation, allowing players to lay out and manage their own virtual city. With simulated citizens that move in or move out if they're not happy with how you're running things. Simulators have also returned to arcades, moving beyond early games to incorporate real-life replicas of motorcycles, snowboards, even whitewater rapids. The future undoubtedly holds new and even broader uses for simulators, including those designed for battling disasters, testing assembly lines before the factory is even built, drawing an even finer line between their virtual world and our reality.